Welcome back to the stage of history. We're going to continue our discussion of the Middle Ages today, looking at feudalism, life on the manor, and the revival of trade and the cities. Let's start with feudalism. It's an economic and political system based on land ownership in exchange for military service. It included a lot of different rights and obligations between the different individuals taking part in the system. Uh, feudal society is going to be structured like a pyramid. At the top you've got the king, then you've got all of his nobles, below them you've got the knights, and then down at the bottom you've got everybody else. Feudalism developed out of a need to protect the land from invasion and attack. Kings would give land to their nobles, the nobles would provide military service, soldiers and whatnot, in exchange. Um, we also see kings giving land to invading tribes in exchange for a pledge of loyalty. This is going to happen with a bunch of the barbarian tribes in the 8 and 900s, basically. They're all going to settle down, start becoming farmers, because that's a whole lot easier and a whole lot more consistent than trying to, you know, raid and kill other people all the time. Um, so at the top of the heap, you have the lord, the landowner, the guy who's got it all. Land in the feudal system is the most important thing. And he's going to give a grant of land, a piece of land called a fief, to a vassal, an individual who swears loyalty to the lord. So the vassal says, I'm going to pledge my loyalty and my honor and my support to you, lord. And in exchange, the lord's going to give him land. And that land is going to be very valuable because the noble can use it to make lots of money. Now, the nobles and the vassals are going to have knights, mounted horsemen who serve the lord in exchange for a, a fief of their own. Um, and then down at the bottom of society, you have peasant farmers and a group called the serfs. So the serfs are people who are bonded to the land. They work on a particular manor farm. They can't really leave that farm. If you're born a serf, you're going to die a serf, and your kids are going to be serfs, and their kids are going to be serfs. And really, it's just, it's just serfs all the way down. It's, it's pretty awful. Lord, do I have to keep doing this? Keep working, surf. Now, tied up in feudalism is this concept of chivalry, an idea of civilized behavior. It's a code of behavior for nobles and knights. Uh, part of it is taking an oath of loyalty to your lord, but there's also an oath to defend the church and defenseless people. Um, there's a bit where it says you have to treat captives as honored guests. So in war, if you capture nobles or knights or even the lord from the other side, when you hold them prisoner, you don't just throw them in the dungeon and let the rats nibble at their toes. You have to treat them as though they're a guest in your home. So they get to sleep in a bed, and they get fed, and they get treated like they're, you know, friends or family. Um, and then eventually you'll ransom them back to the people that they that want them back, I guess. Um, the other part of the code of chivalry is treating women with great respect. Women are treated as these special individuals who are like the center of all that is good and honest and wonderful in life. Now, tied up in feudalism is the manorial system. A manor is the lord's estate. It's a big, massive house surrounded by walls, um, early manors would have actually just been straight-up castles. Um, the manor is self-sufficient. It produces everything that the people living there need. Um, so this includes food, this includes anything for making clothing or tools and weapons, it includes a church, it includes a village for the uh, serfs to live in. Um, and the whole manorial system is based on this set of rights and obligations between a lord and his serfs. The Lord provides protection to the serfs and peasants. In exchange, the serfs and peasants provide the Lord with labor. Um, now, medieval Europe is mostly agricultural. Most of the people working and living in medieval Europe are farmers. That's it. Um, cities, as we discussed earlier, had kind of shrunk uh, in the early Middle Ages because of barbarian attacks. But in the 1000s and 1100s, we're going to start to see the revival of cities and the revival of trade. Uh, it starts with Italian cities. Places like Milan and Venice and Florence are going to grow, and they're going to revive trade in the Mediterranean. It's going to be tied up in the Crusades, which we'll talk about 
later. Um, in Northern Europe, a, king, a small kingdom called Flanders is going to dominate trade. And then over in the Baltic region, there's the Hanseatic League, which is a trade association made up of hundreds of cities working together for a mutual benefit. Kind of like the modern-day European Union, only on a smaller scale. Um, we're also going to see the development of guilds. Guilds are trade associations of different craftspeople. Now, if you've ever played video games like Skyrim or stuff like that, you know that they usually have guilds for everything. There are guilds for carpenters and blacksmiths and assassins and all sorts of stuff. Assassin's guilds really weren't much of a thing, but carpenter guilds and baker's guilds and blacksmith's guilds and all sorts of other guilds like that definitely existed. And they served several purposes. First of all, they helped establish standards of quality for uh, products. So if you are a carpenter and you make tables, if you're a member of the guild, you make the table a certain way, you know that the table is going to be up to a certain quality, and you know that the table is going to have a certain cost to it. And every carpenter who makes tables in town is going to charge the same amount for those tables. They're going to have the same table designs. They're going to be made at the same quality. That's one of the benefits of the guild. You know that the quality is going to be at a certain level. Um, they also set up training and education systems and limit how many people could actually join a trade. So you don't end up with, you know, a village of 100 people with 25 bakers. It might be a little bit out of balance there if you did. Uh, and then, like I said, they're going to set prices for goods and services. So, in some ways, that's not really fair, because they may be setting their prices much higher than they really ought to be, but there's no competition. What are you going to do? Um, increase in trade is going to lead to uh, growth of cities again. People are going to return to old Roman cities, and they're going to develop new cities. Uh, the people moving to these cities are merchants, craftsmen, and artisans. People that aren't necessarily going to be needed on a farm, but do need to be around lots of other people so they can actually, like, do their thing. Um, we're going to see a lot of new cities founded, especially in Northern Europe, in France and Germany, Britain. Um, most of these cities are usually built near castles early on for protection. A lot of the cities themselves have walls around them, because walls provide protection. Now, I want you to understand that when I say cities, I'm not talking about the massive bustling metropoli that we talk that we see nowadays, like New York or London or, you know, Beijing. We're talking about really, really, really small communities of about five or six thousand people on average. These are small cities, not what we would even think of as cities. They're more like small towns. But in the cities, we are going to see the growth and development of a new social class, what's going to be called the bourgeoisie. Uh, comes from a German word, burgers. And I'm not talking about the kind you eat. I'm talking about the kind of burgers that refer to people who live in a city. Uh, from the German word burg for city. So if you get a city like, say, Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, that is literally the city of Pitt. William Pitt being an important English politician that you don't really need to know about. Um, but so the bourgeoisie are going to refer to those merchants, artisans, and craftsmen living in the cities. Um, these individuals are going to have more rights and freedoms than the peasant farmers and the serfs working on the manors. Uh, they've just got more freedom. There's not a lord over them telling them what they have to do. They can choose to follow different professions if they want. If you're the son of a carpenter and you decide you'd rather be a baker, your father can apprentice you to a baker. Um, he may not particularly be happy with you about it, but he could do it. So, living in the city did have its advantages. It also had its disadvantages such as um, dying of plague, but that's a story for another time.